Okay, welcome back everyone. It is 11-4 uh, of 2015. We're going to continue on with uh, Jean Hippolyte and his uh, treatise on Hegel. And we're in our third lesson now. We've looked at uh, sensate reality. We've looked at uh, consciousness and uh, its grasping of the uh, concept. And now we're going to move into the higher cognitive area and start looking at the realm of the true. And so the larger print on the chart is going to be at the very top of the chart. We're going to look at, uh, we've already covered 1 through 4b. We're going to take a look at uh, 5a and 5b. That's going to be the higher cognitive area. And just as a review, we moved out of 4b, which was the uh, the dialectic of uh, Afgehoben, where we would uh, acquire the IDAS forms as force for the objects we confront. But now if we took a look at 5a, we're going to move from concept as IDAS form or force. We're going to transition to the true as the law of dialectic. Now we start looking at relation. Instead of uh, isol isolated IDAS forms, now we're going to start looking at relation. So the first stage is going to be the passive coherence. Um, alteration, our reflection actually alters the concept we begin to understand. The cell provides the measure of proportioning the objectivity of the thing observed. So refraction takes place. Enacting the, this measure creates a refraction of the universal out of the properties that veil the universal. The projected eye or the realm of positing emerges as uh, the self finally realizes that uh, the reflexive moment of our reflection and our uh, our ability to actually uh, alter and qualify the IDAS form ends up being something that we posit in front of us. It becomes the, uh, the object that faces us. It's actually a projected eye that uh, exists in its own posited objectivity. So the realm of positing gets created. We end up with a simple coherence. Um, passive coherence initially represents our positing of the IDAS concept. So initially we just kind of posit the fact that there's a, a pure universal of a simple essence, a simple uh, coherence that represents the IDAS form of the object that we confront. And uh, we need to perceive it in relation and in movement, but uh, what Hippolyte tells us is that initially we're not capable of really grasping that movement process. Initially we start with just first grasping the pure, simple IDAS form in its pure unity, in its simple coherence. That's where we start. We just kind of begin with a building kind of a lexical content, but we don't really work on the structure of that lexical content until 5b. So we're going to take a look at the second stage, which is the passive coherence as an entity without multiplicity is taken as that which reflects back into itself through multiplicity. So now now we're going to take up uh, the properties and we're going to take up multiplicity and how, how are unity and multiplicity interrelated? How are they reciprocal ideas within the concept of the IDAS form? How are unity and multiplicity reciprocally related within the singular IDAS form? Now we really start looking at relation. So if we look at note one, a new opposition of IDAS form emerges. It's no longer just single multiple or unity multiplicity, but now it becomes the being for itself versus the being for another. And it is synthesized as the return back into itself. So we begin to look at the movement of the IDAS forms. We look at them as force, and that's the way Hegel wants to look at them. If you look at the IDAS form as not a static form, but if you look at it as a force that begins as a universal substance, a universal unity, but then goes out of itself in reality, in objective reality, as a display of properties, a display of multiplicity and otherness. But then it collapses back in itself, it returns to itself to reintegrate itself into the it's pure universality, but it becomes a universality that has gone out of itself as multiplicity and then 
reflected back into itself as its IDOS, IDOS form, as an IDOS form of relation. So it's being for itself that goes out of itself as being for another, and then it returns back into itself as a reflexive return. So thing evolves to relation, and we understand the idea of life and relation as being in itself can only be being by going out of itself as being for another. In other words, being can only be being as force. It can't be being just simply as form. It can, it can only be being, according to Hegel, as force. Being must be movement in order to be being. Being is movement, and it must be articulated as movement. It can only be being, capital being, by going out of itself as being for another. And then by going out of itself as being for another, then it can return to itself as a true universality, as a true individuality that has achieved true being as movement. So now our realm of positing becomes a praxis imperative because now we realize that being is essentially movement. The essence of being is movement as force and not static form. Now we realize that praxis becomes an imperative. And note five, the reflexive moment is taken up, which is included in the dialectic. And infinite life becomes the self participating in this dialectic. So now we say not only are the IDAS forms involved in a movement where they go out of themselves as being for another and then gather themselves back within themselves as the reflexive return, but now we realize that uh, our involvement in this process reflexively alters the form and it also conceptualizes the self. It is also a moment of self-identity. It is infinite life for the self. So we now we view ourselves as int integrated in and necessary within this uh, dialectical movement. It's not just the dialectical movement of object. It's the dialectical movement of life and the self participates in this life. So now we have a very different look here and we'll just go over a real quick review just to kind of get a synopsis here because I know that the first areas are kind of in small print but if you look at block one we began with the sensation as object. We kind of looked at the object as the uh, sensate given and uh, we didn't really experience any uh, mediation initially. It was just a, an intuitive grasp of the sensate object as a phantasm uh, that wasn't really an abstraction. But then we moved into the second moment of sensation as subject and we realized that we do play a role, that we do form um, abstractions. Even at the level of phantasms we are forming an abstraction. But we did move beyond that to really looking at the self as a subject of knowledge and we moved on, we lifted the phantasm to a generalized name, and we ended up with a lexical network of generalized names. And uh, so therefore we saw that uh, the generalized name reflected the sensate object and the subject within the realm of the sensate, both reciprocally related to each other, and that relational identity became the generalized name of the object. Not yet an IDAS form, but a generalized name at a very, very uh, primitive proto-conceptual level. Not yet uh, a sign or a concept. But we did realize that we were now going to move into the realm of consciousness and true perception and out of intuition. And that is where we got lifted up into 4A. We transitioned to the... the uh, realm of consciousness and the realm of the Dokunta threshold which uh, really dealt with the common eye and intersubjectivity and the role of dialogue at the dialogue threshold in order to lift these generalized names to a deeper signification to where they could actually we could actually discover the IDAS form that exists within the generalized name but we do that with others we don't do that alone we do that in dialogue and so we moved on to 4B, which was the process, the methodology, which uh, Hegel gave us as uh, Aufgehoben, which was a process of negation, 
preservation and transcendence. But negation, preservation, and transcendence take place within dialogue with other selves. And we learn that uh, through that dialogue, we're seeking universality, but universality needs a workspace. And so the self posited an internal third virtual third party workspace of universality for filing and working on and refining these IDAS forms that the self would discover through the Dakunta threshold of dialogue and extracting the IDAS form out of the generalized name. And so we came out of 4B with uh, not no longer a lexical network of things of a generalized name, but now we had a lexical network of IDAS forms that were in movement, but we really didn't quite understand how that movement worked. But we did acquire, and this is the last lesson, we did acquire that lexical network of IDAS forms. But now, how do we understand these IDAS forms as movement? Because that's the truth. The truth is the IDAS form is a movement. And so we moved up uh, in this lesson to 5A, which was uh, grasping the IDAS form as a force, which was a law of dialectic. That force, that movement, is the law of dialectic. It's a dialectical movement of the uh, IDAS form going out of itself. It begins as for itself, but it goes out of itself as for another. And then it returns to itself to redefine a more refined version of its universality, a more refined version of its IDAS identity. And so we learned that IDAS identity and IDAS form is truly a law of dialectic. It's a movement of dialectic. So it's a it's an IDAS. IDAS is IDAS dialectic. That's what we learned in 5A. So once we learn that IDAS is IDAS dialectic, then we want to move on to uh, really grasping how that affects us. We went on to 5B, and we realized that uh, it affects us by really putting a demand on us to participate in the process as infinite life, and that now we enter into a realm of the imperative of praxis, the imperative of going out of ourselves and not just viewing this process of objects, but it's a process of objects and subjects together, and therefore it's about self-identity as well as the identity of history and objectivity. It's also a process of infinite life and subjective identity. And so we ended up at the end of this lesson with a real grasp of the necessity or the imperative of praxis. And now our realm of positing becomes a praxis imperative and we do realize the importance of the reflexive moment and the fact that this entire dialectic for Hegel is all about historical identity along with self-identity. We're working on the concept of what it means to be a human being at the same time as we work on the concept of what is the true in history. What is the true in history and what is the true of self-identity? What's the true of humanity and what is the true of history? So we end up with a very comprehensive picture now that gives us a very brief synopsis of uh, 